Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jose Diaz, Chief Curator at the Andy Warhol Museum. Thank you for joining us for Fantasy America, Authors in Conversation, featuring Alan Palaez and Jessica Lene Moore. This program is inspired by our current exhibition, Fantasy America, which invites New York-based artists Nona Faustine, Kambui Olajime, Pacifico Solano, Nama Sabar, and Chloe Weiss to revisit Andy Warhol's 1985 publication titled America and to contribute through their own artistic practices. The works in this exhibition probe and challenge the perceptions of what America is and what it can become. Like Warhol, the artists in this exhibition hold a mirror to society, reflecting the country at a critical juncture in history. Each produces work that blurs the boundaries between form and material, offering a complex picture of contemporary American life. The exhibition includes a catalog with contributions from today's speakers. Jessica Lene Moore is an art writer, poet, librettist, and short fiction writer. She is a frequent contributor to Bomb Magazine and has interviewed artists such as Howard Dina Pindell, Ellen Atsui, and Rick Rick Terra Venetia. Her poetry can be found in Poet Lore, Indiana Review, The Common, among others. Her debut poetry collection titled Amphibian won the 2020 Naomi Long Magic Poetry Prize from Broadside Lotus Press. Her short fiction can be found in Tahoma Literary Review, Duende, and Black Candies. Alan Palaez is an Afro-Indigenous poet and installation and adornment artist from Oaxaca, Mexico. They are the author of Intergalactic Travels, Poems from a Fugitive Alien, which was a finalist for the 2020 International Latino Book Award, and To Love and Mourn in the Age of Displacement by Nomadic Press 2020. Please join me as we listen to them talk about the artists in the exhibition, the life and legacy of Andy Warhol, and the complexities around the concept of America. I would also like to thank the team at the Warhol, as well as our sponsors for making today's program possible. Thank you for joining, and please check out warhol.org for additional programs and upcoming exhibitions. Enjoy. So you mentioned that you wanted to talk about Kambui Olujimi's T minus zero out of all of the works in the exhibition. And why is that? You know, I think that um, when I first saw this installation, I was pretty much taken aback um, in the sense that Warhol's writings and Warhol's art is all about America, right? As in the United States and this notion of belonging and being united um, and these flags significantly they don't contradict Warhol's um, understandings of America, but they nuance it. Um, and it, for me, they bring to light the ways in which uh, the concept of nationality, patriotism is a non-consensual contract mm -hmm. that people enter with nation states. Uh, for example, Warhol as a child of migrants, right, enters this non-consensual contract of being born in the United States and then seeing, um, having to see himself performing Americanity. Um, and we see it throughout like his um, body of work. Um, but for Kambui um, Olujimi's work, um, and the fact that he's a black artist portraying flags um, that allude to destruction um, or natural disaster um, or man-made disaster, right? Is this notion that uh, blackness, as Christina Sharp um, writes about, embodies a citizenship that is not bound to be protected. And so um, this installation evades uh, speaking about a black identity mm -hmm. and more to a black condition, right? These are the conditions that black people experience in the Americas, um, but because they are flags, they enter into a global circuit. Um, so it's not just the Americas, but all the continents. Um, and I think that restaging a flag is also speaking back to empire. It's this idea of you're using a flag to say, these are our citizens of our nation. We're willing to protect you as long as you carry out certain stories about what the nation state is. Mm -hmm. And in restaging flags of destruction or flags that um, are embedded in criticisms of the nation, um, Kambui Olujimi almost performs a sense of bad citizenship, mm -hmm. a bad citizenship that is necessary in order to look towards the future. And I think that uh, all of the 
pieces, all of the artworks in fantasy America are gesturing to a future um, and also gesturing to a critique of a destruction that some people think is coming or um, is being experienced right now. But for most, I think, of the artists, that destruction um, has been ongoing. It's something that started before they were born and has not ended. And that's where the critiques are coming in. And I think that this installation, T-0, brings out all of those themes um, in incredible ways. I like the way that you bring up consent. And it makes me think of James Baldwin's essay, Whiteness and Other Lies, and thinking about the construction of race, particularly in the United States, in terms of how the foundation of whiteness is violence. And so even when you think about Andy Warhol's experience of getting here or being born here at a certain time and thinking about his family's ancestry, I wonder at how much consent, right, Andy Warhol had to the kind of whiteness that he became privy to and privileged to participate in as America unfolded before him, stretching from the 20s through the Great Depression through World War II and going and going like into um, his final days and how much he saw the country change. But then I also think about this in terms of citizenship as well, right? Mm -hmm. The people who are enacted upon when it comes to this violence that's supportive of a certain kind of white citizenry are Native American and indigenous and black bodies. And so the flag in a way when it's a the symbol of the nation state specifically also has a lot to do with how black and brown bodies become symbolic of that imperialism in other places, almost transnationally against their will without their own consent. Mm -hmm. And I think that these flags kind of using the images of explosions or rocket takeoff or space colonization as an expression of hegemony and expression of power is very much tied to that ideation, right? Like how do we become racialized in this context and how it changes based on which nation state as a reality we enter into. I think that these flags are gesturing towards that end, right? Because it's like race is a construction that one enters in and out of at all moments. Mm -hmm. um, and when an apocalypse happens, what might go in the apocalypse, race might end, right? Gender might end. And then like new formations um, of embodiment and being in relation with one another might um, emerge. And I think that's um, what a lot of your writing is talking about and kind of like gesturing to in Fantasy America. I mean, I think that when I sit down to write something, especially it's important for me to have as much contact with the artist as possible. I am interested in representing a critical scholarly intimacy with the artist. I'm not here to speak for the artist, overspeak mm. the artist. I'm not here to intervene in what their purposes are in creating the work that they create that's incredibly um, personal, incredibly intimate, incredibly political, attached to their body, and then sent into the world after that detachment happens. And so I, I think very carefully about the questions that I ask when I'm engaging with artists. And in constructing these essays for Fantasy America's catalog, it was important to me to have the input of each artist. So I spoke with them, some of them two times. I let them see the naked, vulnerable first draft. I allowed them to make changes because I am not here to speak over and have no right to speak over their experience in creating the things that they have created and put into the world. Mm -hmm. It's important for me to have a connection, even if that connection only continues to exist within the text itself. I have to respect those boundaries. And if they're not there, it's important to set them. It feels like a different methodology, right? A different way of approaching art, because often I think that artists are looked at as these creators that then create for, for an audience, as opposed to people who are making art in the world that is insisting themselves onto them. And I think that your approach is like, yeah, your life in this world, like, am I saying this accurately? Am I misrepresenting you? Like, um, is this going off the, the, the far end? And I think that comes up in some of Warhol's work, mm -hmm. right? Um, you wanted to talk about um, representations of both uh, Sitting Bull, right? So when I was reading the introduction that you wrote to Fantasy America, you were very much adamant in explaining the foundational occurrences on this soil that we call the Americas. Mm -hmm. And it's of indigenous dispossession and the interruption of Native American and indigenous sovereignty 
because those are the grounds upon which citizenship is established. I was thinking a lot about Robert Miller's summary of the doctrine of discovery, right? Over the 16th century, um, we, from the, well, from the 15th century to the 16th century, we have Spain, Spain, England, um, France, Germany, and various other countries extending and developing this document that says, well, if you are not Christian, and if you are not citizen in European nation states, then you do not exist. You do not have a body. And the geography of the Americas was called terra nullius, or an empty land. And so if you can imagine the, the, myth, the mythography that has to be created of the self in order to drive people to cross thousands of miles of ocean to walk up to people who've inhabited a land for millennia and wave a piece of paper in their face that they can't read and say, oh, by the way, you don't own this land anymore. And in order to extend hegemony, in order to make sure that those bodies were available for work, that those bodies were available to remain symbols and built civilizations in the Americas, the terms of the doctrine of discovery were changed, right? Mm -hmm. Some Native Americans had ownership of their land, but they couldn't sell it without the permission of the queen. Mm -hmm. Some Native Americans didn't have any ownership at all. And it changed from Brazil to the northeastern coast of, of North America, all the way down to Patagonia. And so I think critically about the images, these images of Sitting Bull. And then I think of Russell Means, who's Oglala Lakota, who uh, mm -hmm. was a Native American activist um, in the 50s and the 60s. So the Sitting Bull image is a rendition of an Edward, an Edward Curtis photograph mm -hmm. of Sitting Bull. Mm -hmm. And I think of the ways that Warhol has attempted I think I could say a reappropriation through adding in a kind of color that's meant to reinduce some kind of vibrance into this image, right? Highly constructed images. And how I wonder how much consent, as we've spoken about, Sitting Bull had in this image taken of him. And then I wonder, I think about Russell Means and I think about his purposeful posing, his consent mm -hmm. that's obvious in these photographs and what it meant to him to be represented as a Native American, Oglala Lakota Native American, an activist, but in Andy Warhol's vision, right? How Andy Warhol decided to construct America and technicolor and repetitive reproduction and what that meant to him. And so I wondered what you think of these images coming from the perspective that you provided for us in the introduction, thinking about how it was the unlanding of black life from the coast of Africa to the Americas and the purposeful unlanding of indigenous bodies here by forcing them off, off of their, um, I don't want to say ownership because that's not correct, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But their occupancy, their stewardship of the land, right? Um, and how these things relate in terms of how Andy Warhol thinks of America and his work and then what it means at the intersection of these images that he's created. Right. Wow, that's a great question. Because the first thing that comes to my mind is this idea of intimacy, right? The intimacy between the camera lens and then the subject being photographed. Um, and also you bring up non-consent again. Um, there's only so much intimacy that one can consent to under settler colonialism, right? Um, because the goal under settler colonialism is to live, mm -hmm. is to survive it. Um, and when I look at these images and the reappropriation re of them, I wonder what was Warhol's commitment to indigenous life? And that's super important for us to ask because Warhol's narrative, I think, um, has been taken up in very different ways in the academy and both in the museum world. Um, very little, I think, do people talk about uh, migration when talking about Warhol mm -hmm. and kind of how his artwork um, has been taken by academics and by museum um, museum workers to talk about like, oh, you know, this represents um, an American dream. And it also represents the idea that um, America is built by immigrants, which immediately um, removes the indigenous subject. And photography has always done that. Photography um, has been a technology of surveillance for both black people and indigenous people. When we look at, for example, um, at early photography, um, not even pre-photography was like illustrations, right? When we think about the, the Fugitive Slave Act, right? You have, we have illustrations of um, black subjects in flight. Um, and usually the illustrations are 
the subject is the same size as the tree, right? So it brings this notion of like an enormous subject doing something that is illegal or criminal. When we think about the American Indian boarding school, we, we see we have an excess um, of visual representation of indigenous peoples, mm -hmm. but the camera is trying to control them. Um, it's a representation of, well, this isn't what Americanity is. This is not good citizenship. Um, and then we have like, after they come out of the American Indian boarding schools, we have new representations um, of them wearing, you know, some, sometimes like three-piece suits or whatever. And I think that these images are alluding to the ways in which we are taught to think of the body um, and the right to be in community with others as, as separate. Um, I feel like that sounds theoretical, but citizenship has always been about who are you um, in community with, who, whose resemblance can you identify with? And I think that the images on our right, right, I feel like they're isolated in a way that in Warhol's world, they are in citizenship with his art. But in the material world, um, these are subjects that the U.S. does not know what to do with. Mm -hmm. These are subjects that bring tension to the U.S. because it contests the idea that we are united. Um, and then when we think about the Russell Means photographs, um, they're photographs that refuse being mastered, right? Warhol in kind of like reappropriating them in his own way, he masters the images. Um, and he extrapolates a narrative to fit his narrative of migration um, and cohesion, but also, um, what he refers to like the mood swings of America, right? Like one day we'll accept you, one day we won't. Mm -hmm. um, you'll only trend for so much. Um, but the Russell Means photographs, he refuses to look at the, um, at the aperture of the camera, right? Um, and in doing that, we have to ask questions, right? When his hands are like close to his chin, what is he thinking about? Um, what is, not only what is he thinking about, but um, is that comfortable? Mm -hmm. um, I also think about like, was his body shaking? Um, what does it mean to be able to capture this image without any other form of mobility, but knowing that he is in motion at that moment? Um, and it's this so sense of stillness. Mm. Uh, we narrate the US as um, a place of possibility. Possibility for whomst, right? What do they have to look like? Mm -hmm. What do they have to sound like? How do they have to move like? Um, and when I think about Warhol's body of work, um, I'm always like, okay, you have so many critiques and also you're very much invested in fitting in um, with the nation you're critiquing and the nation that you, you sometimes don't feel like wants you to exist with it. Right. And this makes me think of Kara Keeling, right? Mm -hmm. Like the, the Black queer scholar and thinking about her theory of cinematic images. And she says, every individual has a bank of images that are from everyday life that are often reflections of what's portrayed in popular cinema on TV, how we reconstruct ourselves avataristically after what's most popular. And then that becomes entrapped in our mind and it becomes a kind of common sense, right? Mm -hmm. And that makes me think about Warhol. Earlier when we were doing a walkthrough with the curator, Jose Diaz, there was a mention about Andy Warhol getting a nose job. And it really, really made me think about the pressure or the ideations that he had about a certain kind of cinematic image mm -hmm. of whiteness that he probably felt like he needed to fit into. And as his career went on, he was able to, well, not able to, not by any means, he had the experiences of having true American violence, violence inflicted upon him right. as somebody who is constantly trying to reconstruct themselves, no matter how anachronistically in relationship to celebrity, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. And then I think about being entrapped by cinematic images, what made Russell Means pose in mm -hmm. this very kind of like photogenic way. Um, what are the cin cinematic images in, in his mind? Then that brings to mind uh, Native American theorists like Jody Bird, right? And thinking about Indianness as this collective veneer, this cinematic image, right? That's this overarching representation that invisibilizes almost 600 different Native American groups. Yeah. 
um, in order to fit into an American narrative. And Andy Warhol, if he, I mean, he's a master at many things, but definitely was a master at capturing the performance, the performativity of Americanness, the myth of America. Mm -hmm. One thing that really stands out to me about America, the photo book that he compiled, is the ways in which he juxtaposes the plentitude of the nation state, but then reveals the myth of it by saying, but why did you close public baths? Mm -hmm. But then you vilify people who are houseless, and then you close the public public baths, so that way now everyone's offended by a smell. There's this continuous critique and deep thinking that seems to be a major point of conflict because in Warhol's, well, Warhol's heart, I think that he, until his final days, believed in the possibility, right? But he had the privilege, right, via his ability to mirror a cinematic whiteness, to believe in that, mm -hmm. where many of the people in his community, like um, the model Luna, Daniel Luna, died of a heroin overdose, right? What were the final days of her? What were the cinematic images in her not mind of blackness and beauty and where she came from that tortured her to that end? Right. And I, and I think when I hear you talk about how he had the privilege, I, I also would say that... It, he found the privilege, right? Like he learned how to identify what what had power in both the art world and in like the U.S. at large, strive to it, which is indicative of, for example, like the nose job. Um, and that promise still failed him, mm -hmm. right? So it's this notion of, yes, um, whiteness and the ideologies of whiteness, right? Because whiteness is an ideology. Um, the ideology of whiteness um, has to eventually fail the ones it's going to protect in order for it to maintain um, its social, cultural, political power. Um, and I think that Fantasy America is responding to that. Like, it is a, a move against whiteness. It is like, this thing is going to fail everybody. Mm -hmm. And in order for us to propel into an elsewhere, we need to address it right now. Um, and I think that that's why your inclusion um, in Fantasy America um, was so important. And I think it's only the only reason why I also said yes to writing for it. Because <laughs> uh, I was like, I'm not going to write for a museum, you know? Um, and I think that I said yes because I don't necessarily trust artists, but I trust certain people. And I trust the way that you interview. I trust your poetry. I trust your collage work. Um, and I did want to ask you, as a writer, um, kind of like going through through all of these images, because right, like we're in COVID, we had to like look at all the images digitally, mm -hmm. um, sitting in your own stillness, going through uh, the show, and then developing your questions. How did your collage art inform how you were going to tackle this project? Um, collage as a as a methodology of writing, but also as a way to be intimate. Because collage is about um, reassembling objects, um, rethinking them, reimagining them, giving um, people, places, um, ephemera, a form of power that they, they, they did not have before, or maybe a form of power that was misrecognized or unidentified. Um, can you talk about that as a writer and as an artist? Absolutely. Um, I remember when Maya Marshall, my lion, um, wrote the review of Amphibian, which is my debut poetry collection that won the Naomi Long Magic Poetry Award under the judgment of Toy Derricotte. Mm -hmm. um, and in the review, she called me an artist. And I was like, oh, no, now everybody knows because it's a huge secret, right? I, it's a huge secret for people who don't know me because I can easily pack away my collage materials and my little cans of media, you know, like matte media away mm -hmm. in different drawers in my home when people um, come to visit me. And I think my obsession with collage comes from, you know, I don't come from an environment in which I had a lot of mentorship that disciplined me into doing things one way. Mm -hmm. And I think that there are ways that that is a benefit as much as it comes at cost. I was raised in Key West, Florida and the Florida Keys. My great grandmother and my great grandfather were a major part of my life. My great grandmother worked for David Wachowski, 
who's the richest man on the island. Um, and there were many times in my childhood where my mom would go pick her up from work and I would go with her and I would see David, David's house and there would be fashion magazines and museum exhibition catalogs. And so I've always had a remove from the actual object itself. Mm. It took me a while to get to a place where I had the privilege of actually seeing the actual two-dimensional, three-dimensional object in front of me as its actual self. And so I learned how to read these documents and texts without much guidance. I learned how to look up the words myself. I learned how to be curious. My fascination with Warhol comes from hearing my mother say at a very young age, I want to be the black woman Andy Warhol and seeing the possibilities of her life prevent her from becoming a commercial artist. And to this day, watching her doodle on napkins and hide them from me, she doesn't want me to see. Mm. Um, I'm not very good at drawing. And so I became a writer because I couldn't draw. <laughs> I said, how am I going to do this? I said, I can write and draw. And so that's where the collage comes from, piecing and putting and finding my own way intuitively through theoretical materials, through artistic materials. And so when I make collages, I'm usually at home in Macon, Georgia, where my mom lives. I go dumpster diving. I pull out housekeeping. I pull out glamour. I pull out Southern comfort. I pull out any magazine that has images in it. And I go through this very painstaking process of choosing pages with objects on it that I prefer, then going through and cutting them out with a razor and turning them into something where you can't even predict where those objects came from in the mm. first place. And for me, that's imagination. Baudelaire said that imagination is taking the world around you and reproducing it where it's unrecognizable to itself. I didn't want to create a fantasy, right? For me, fantasy is having an object in your mind that without consent or collaboration, you just force into the world mm. and everyone must abide by it if they'll survive. I think of what's possible in imagination. And so when I think of Pacifico Solano's work, I decided to talk about his work because I saw the work in digital images. And in the digital images, even as I zoomed in, I missed the materiality, mm -hmm. right? The paper materiality of the shadow of the overlay, the staples that are coming undone, the vintage physique magazine and the like old male gay porn magazines and how via a kind of Mondrian-esque blueprint, there are these gentle ice, ice pop colors that soften the bodies, that invited intimacy, and it seems to be this very intimate stacking of worlds, right? The body is no longer permanently rendered in the stress mm -hmm. of a sexuality. The body is in repose and peeking and gesturing. You have this ability to appreciate the way that the body in the red short is lounging, right? And just displaying its body, its thighs, its sex, its crotch. You have this opportunity to enjoy this eye peering from amongst these colors and just kind of looking at you. And all of a sudden, because of the construction that Pacifico does, it's not so much about come hither, but as much it's also about seeing. Mm -hmm. Like someone peeking around a corner and saying, well, can you see me? my all, even though my come hither look is here, there's all of me here. And even just this arm or just this leg, each of these overlays creates a post and lintel that's a doorway into an intimacy. And he reveals that through how he layers and kind of allows these works to rest together. And then um, the wall text talks about the exhibition in Ball Harbor that Pacifico Solano and Jose Diaz pulled out of because they asked for more family-friendly material in Ball Harbor. I grew up going to Fantasy Fest in Goombe, and I thought it was unconscionable, <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, I remember my pediatrician was the drag queen of Fantasy Fest for multiple years in my childhood, and it just seemed so out of touch and out of culture and, out and ahistoric to mm. what the 305, what everything from Miami down to the Keys has been. And so I was very happy to see these images here again and very, very touched. Um, I too have lost family members to, you know, the AIDS crisis. Um, and I've seen people lose their sanity to how it was handled by the government mm -hmm. and how we handled it as a community. 
And to see so many of these models that did perish in the AIDS crisis be represented with a little bit more of their humanity, some dignity, some privacy, mm -hmm. right? Not that them showing their sex wasn't dignified, right? Showing your sex and your sexuality should always be considered dignified because it's beautiful. But at this moment, this is something different. And so I feel Solano, Pacifico, he's creating a new moment for being alive through mm -hmm. collage. And that's what I think. A lot of times when I do collage, I'm looking at ways to reconstruct my own body in a way that I own and that is uninterrupted. Um, and it's queerness and it's black womanness and it's um, dedication to doing things in the way I have to do them in order for me to have some integrity in what I've made my life purpose. And so writing about these was just amazing for me, right? Like I was very much like a, like a kid in, the, in a candy store when I saw the colors. I was just given so much joy um, child joy, but also, you know, like womanly joy, right? In terms of thinking about sex being represented or sexuality and gender being represented in such a concentrated, careful way, mm -hmm. rather than what we do slap dash every day as we, you know, run into each other on the street with all of our expectations that make us feel more secure than the person we're talking to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but I also wanted to... I wanted to go back a little bit because I think of your scholarship, um, and we talk often about your dissertation, and I can't wait. <laughs> I know you're like, I don't talk about that. <laughs> it's like, I can't wait. But I think about, again, the juxtaposition of all of these contexts, right? And I started thinking about a collection of dates thing around like 40 years before, right? Like Warhol was born, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I think about, um, the Chinese Ex Exclusion Act in 1880. Think about the founding of the NAACP in 1909. Think of the Harlem Renaissance. I think of the 1924 Indian Citizenship Act. I think about Brazil finally ending slavery in 1888. For the second time. For the second time. <laughs> I think about um, the establishment of Greenwich Standard Time during that same year that Brazil for the second time mm -hmm. outlawed slavery. And then I think about the consciousness of this young man, right, coming into this environment in this world. And I really, really think that at this moment when we think about race and gender, this was the time when people were really trying to establish in monolith what each of these things meant, right? Mm -hmm. And it's also during a time where you see so much exclusion, you see also the open door policy between Europe and the Americas. Yeah. Not only did the United States receive an influx of European immigrants, so did Argentina, mm -hmm. so did Mexico, so did some places in the Caribbean, and it was in an effort to whiten populations. Yeah. And I think about what that meant for the kind of consciousness mm -hmm. that Warhol would have grown up in, having the multiple um, collisions of these events yeah. create the environment in which he was and how you see all of these collisions happening around him in terms of thinking about identity and him being a creative body mm -hmm. that was somewhat, I think, at least when I, when I think critically about it, I think that there's something about whiteness that probably impeded upon who Warhol probably wanted to be or how he wanted to be considered for real. I mean, yeah, I mean... For Warhol, I'm assuming that the world he inherited was a world that his parents also didn't really know, right? So for his family unit, it must have been like collage, like cut and paste what is obvious, what you do know, and like right. go with it. Um, and I think that perhaps this is where um, his queerness or his, his queerness comes in, right? Um, even to, even to the, to the date, like queerness is not something that is necessarily welcomed or respected mm -hmm. or valued. Like yes, there might be um, protection laws for LGBTQ people, but protection laws mean nothing if LGBTQ people are still, for example, murdered by the state. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that in the time that, well, in the 40 years prior to Warhol and in the time he was alive, I think that there were negotiations that had to be made. Um, and I do not say this as a historian of like Warhol, right? But as somebody that is 
um, alive in the art world and understands the the circulation of artists and who is allowed in and who is who is not allowed in. Um, I think that there is a way in which Warhol may have been palpable. Um, and that palpability um, kind of deprioritizes queerness, or maybe his queerness was a form of palpable way in which to exist as white. Because um, as you said earlier in the talk, like, he entered into whiteness. It's not that like Warhol was just like this white person, right? Because mm -hmm. um, he's creating work when racialization is being engineered in the Americas. The policies that you're naming, um, they're theorized in South America as blanqueamiento, which is the open... Adelantando. Yeah, adelantando la raza as mm -hmm. well. The open policies, blanqueamiento is particular to Brazil and Cuba, where governments um, would sometimes even pay for the relocation of European migrants so that those countries could look lighter skinned. Um, and I'm wondering what his commitment, like earlier when you asked me about like the reappropriation of the image of Sitting Bull, again, what is his commitment? Um, it's not enough to just be around racialized subjects. If you're going to be around racialized subjects, those subjects need to know what one's commitment for their future is. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I feel that Warhol was deeply um, indebted to America as like an entity. Um, and it's sometimes like, hard, right? I think that when I was writing this, I was like, okay, I want to be honest about the condition of possibilities. And this exhibition, although it is critiquing the U.S. by naming the fantasy, um, do we really understand the weight of, of, of what America is for a lot of people? Um, you were talking about the difference between imagination and fantasy earlier. Um, and I don't know if the people watching are gonna like hear you, right? Because um, I think that the US is still, America is still a fantasy. Mm -hmm. um, there is this understanding that in America, things can just drastically change for you if you work hard for it um, and all of that shit. Um, and the, 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 the narrative of America is never about um, are people cared for in America, but are people like exceeding and like making names for themselves? I, for example, even this image, right, this Pacifico Solano um, series, what it brings to me, it's that notion of caring. You can still care for, um, for example, like you see the staples, right? You, what people might assume is waste, right? Mm -hmm. Like a pamphlet or whatever, you can still offer care to it. Um, you see a subject um, that is, not fully there, but you know it's there and you want to care for it, right? The colors bring in this form of softness. Um, what we lack is not necessarily um, resources. What we lack is care. I think that um, towards the end of um, Warhol's life, what Warhol lacked was care. Um, I think that a lot of the the conversations we have around minoritized communities, like what they lack is not protection by the state, what they lack is care by the people that um, they're supposed to be in day-to-day um, -day relationship with. Um, and all the exclusionary acts that you named and some of the inclusionary ones, kind of like the NAACP, right? Mm -hmm. um, all of them, I think, at the root of it is the denial or the potential offering of care. Um, and that's what I'd rather talk about. Um, for me, America represents the absolute denial of care um, for um, an individualistic society. You know, I was reading the book, um, uh, A Taste for Brown Sugar, Black Women in Pornography by mm -hmm. Merrill Miller Young. And she has this quote about neoliberalism that's like, no matter, and I'm paraphrasing, it's no matter what your circumstances are or what intersection at which you live in the United States, there's a part of neoliberalism that says that if you can't make it, it's your fault. 
and you don't deserve care and you don't deserve understanding for your failures, no matter how implicit it is within the system that you be fined mm -hmm. in your life and socially and politically and economically for the things that you cannot control. If you can't overcome the, garga the, the gargantuan system that reproduces these things, then you're on your own. And mm -hmm. then I think about what you're talking about about Andy Warhol, and then I think again about violence, right? Mm -hmm. um, in his diaries, he doesn't write about the death of Gould, his partner who dies as a product of AIDS and leaves mm -hmm. him to mm -hmm. go to California in order to pass away. Mm -hmm. He doesn't write about um, having his wig snatched off at a signing for the photo book, America. Mm -hmm. He doesn't write about being shot by Solanas. And it makes me wonder how becoming the subject of a violence that he often depicted was indescribable for him. You talk about the failure of whiteness. And I think that there is that, that those are specific examples where Warhol found himself threatened by the very world in which he was trying to integrate himself as well as find integration through you know, this, the, this silver factory and all of the people he allowed into his life and worked with, um, that there's that point of failure. Yeah. And it was almost, in, he couldn't bring it to words, not even words that he may have had an idea that no one or hoped that no one would ever see. And mm -hmm. they end up not seeing it because he didn't write about it. And I think about how that inability to communicate that interruption of, of such a persona that was based on survival and his work and his life was a lack of care, yeah. right? He came to a point where he didn't have enough people around him perhaps to amel ameliorate, to soften, to mitigate some of those things he experienced finally on his own body as mm. he aged, as the wig became more obviously not his hair, as there were certain things he could not hide anymore. Um, and I wonder what you make of that relationship there, the care not received as a form of violence, but also a kind of whiteness as a violence that failed, right? Yeah. He failed to probably participate fully enough in it, right? Yeah. Became a target of the, war, of the fantasy that he wanted to participate in. Right, so this is really interesting because I think one of the things that your question brings up is the difference between um, critique and material reality, mm -hmm. right? Um, in the in the photo collection um, America, like there's so much critique, um, and he's documenting it. He's photographing um, what people might assume is like injustices um, in the U.S. Um, and then, like towards the end of his life, it's like he's a target of some of these injustices. Um, and I think it's speaking to the ways in which, in his striving towards whiteness, he's also um, Rejecting whiteness, mm -hmm. um, which I think is where his immigrant heritage comes in, his immigrant experience, right? It's not like one knows that one is not from here, right? And yet one has to perform uh, being from here in order to survive here. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of artists, I think, are up against this big battle of how do I create work in this world? when the material reality um, is so different than what the work is depicting. Um, it's negotiations. Um, I think that Warhol, when those incidents happened to him, those like particular violences, it's like, fuck. What does it mean to um, imagine a livelihood outside of hyperproductivity, mm -hmm. a livelihood outside of recognition, mm -hmm. um, and a livelihood outside of relationships solely based on the fact that one is an artist, right? Because it's like, I would rather be in relationship with someone that I know will care for me than with somebody that looks like me. Because mm -hmm. it's like, okay, you look like me, but what does that say about anything? Right. Or, oh yeah, we might share a queer identity, but what does that say about anything, right? It's like, 
Um, I wonder what would have happened if, or what would happen now if artists extended care to one another um, as the first and foremost priority over trying to figure out like, oh, this person's making art about that, like we should be in conversation, right? Because it's like, okay, yeah, you might make similar art, but the conditions that lead to the art making, some things aren't the best, right? I think about, for example, um, I mean, even this, like the, this, co this collection, right? So if I want to think about Faustine's work, um, we always have to ask, like, what were the conditions? Mm -hmm. um, some of the art that is exhibited right now in Fantasy America should have never been made because nobody should have ever survived um, what the art is depicting. Mm -hmm. um, we have to be better consumers. We have to be better viewers. We have to um, develop a practice of like denouncing violence as it is happening and not after it's been memorialized over and over again and shown in exhibits over and over again. Mm -hmm. I think that's what's the problem. Um, we want to say, oh, yeah, this happened and it is important and this politic is critical, but what are we doing about it? Um, I wonder if Warhol, like, in his last moments, like, reflected and was like, oh, could I have done more than the critique? Or maybe was it... Um, did I do that? I do. Did I actually do more than critique? And that's what led me to this place. Mm -hmm. um, when whiteness betrays itself, what happens? There's something that makes me think of uh, Frederick Jameson and, th and and what he wrote about modernity versus contemporaneity. Contemporaneity oh, mm -hmm. is pastiche, right? And modernity is parody. I think he said. And I think about the level of consumerism that Warhol participated in mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as an expression. And then it makes me think also of these physique magazines, because the physique magazines weren't only images um, that catered to or became very prominent in gay male communities. They also sold, sold things, right? They sold little buttons, little pins certain items of clothing, certain shoes, certain kinds of hair gel, hairstyles. And that became the way that you signaled to someone through consumerism mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that you belonged, right? And so you ended up participating in this consumerist kind of parody of something in order for you to take on a certain style of being that required that you have resources to expend, right? And in a lot of ways, I think Warhol interfaced with America as a fantasy through how his work was consumed, right, and thinking about seriality, mm -hmm. quick repro, and pricing, and then also what he consumed, what he bought, right, like um, 50 Tiffany's grade dish sets, <laughs> right, and, and phone bill unpaid, right, mm -hmm. no interest in paying it, right, and it makes me think about contemporaneity as this effort to somewhat do the same, but with citation, Mm. Now we're in this effort to kind of represent our identities through consumerism, but with citation, right? Like I, I know now that a part of my performance of myself is being able to say that this thing I'm doing comes from here and here and here and here and here. Whereas before it wasn't about cita cit citation as much, as much as it was about just doing it, right? And just having it. Um, and when you get towards the end of your life and you experience a certain amount of violence based on aging, based on vulnerability, based on loss, mm -hmm. um, loss that was difficult for him to grapple with, you know, you, you come to a point where you, when that's the way you've identified, it, it crumbles, yeah. right? And it creates a cognitive dissonance, right? Because you get to a point where you're like, well, it doesn't matter how much I consume. And suddenly you're in this mirrored position to those who are more disenfranchised or dispossessed than you, who no matter how much they consume, no matter how much, how many resources they have, they still are standing outside of their mansion like Henry Louis Gates getting arrested because someone thinks they're breaking into someone else's house, mm -hmm. right? And so I think about that relationship and how time moves and how identity often ends up shuffled through a series of receipts, right? Like what does, wow. what does, that, what does that mean for ourselves, right? The thing about Nona's work that I love is the 
there's a kind of anti-materiality to it, and this is what I mean. A lot of black contemporary artists are additive, right? Mm -hmm. There's a certain practice of like horror vacui that's a big practice in like portraiture now or assemblage or installation, right? It's the, it's the adding on as we discover more and more about our history, right? We have to add on, right? We're trying to fill in the blanks, right? But with Nona, she literally strips down naked, nude, and stands before a building where mm -hmm. black men go and lose the majority of their lives every day and they do it like it's normal, mm -hmm. like their deaths and disappearances are expected. And she captures that in a photograph. And the most important materiality is not only the existence of her body in front of that building, but the enraptured capturing mm -hmm. of that image in the still of it as a constant confrontation that viewers have to deal with. The black line striking through the images um, in the series that's here in Fantasy America yeah. and the resonances of how many, and then the, and the prints in this particular um, iteration of the work, it's like pixels. And I can't help but imagine each pixel as a mouth, <laughs> a black mouth that's just yelling. Yeah. And we don't know if it's for joy or for fear, mm -hmm. but it's there creating this incised interruption in what Abraham Lincoln is supposed to, is supposed to mean rather than the material reality of what he did. Yeah. Right? Like those are the things that I think about when I like and like revisit the catalog. Yeah. Um and feel very proud to have worked with you and Jose or even just think of the work itself. Mm -hmm. No, and in the catalog, you have this brilliant way in which you write about it. Um, I'm just going to pull it out. Um, you talk about the, the line, right, as a digitized screen. Mm -hmm. And I think that when I received the images um, and read like the, one of the drafts of your, your essay, I was like, wow, um, these images are screaming. Um, and I also recognize the scream inside of me, right? Like the, the suffocation of moving in a world um, that is continuously like against um, queer futures, against black futures, um, against indigenous futures. Um, I feel like you gave me language through um, like the artwork. And I know that we're like coming close to our ending. So I want to ask you, what is it about this present that you want to abandon so that we can actually be in a better future and um, no longer reproduce um, the same violences that both Warhol was experiencing and that the artists in this exhibition are experiencing and speaking against? What is it that we should abandon? Or what is it that you personally need to um, like let go or be abolished or anything of that uh, matter? The thing that I try to turn into detritus in my life every day is unlove. I'm a person who grew up seeing her mother actively unloved. Mm -hmm. And it changed me as a black woman. And I've had to walk in my paces backwards and forwards and in circles and an act of mourning that also had to be an act of euphoria. Mm. You have to walk into the screen in order to find that source of yourself, that love that is uncompromisable. I don't work with people I don't love or feel like I can't have love for them. That is my integrity. Mm. And whatever that means for my career, that's what it means. But my health as an artist, as a woman, as a person who gladly throws themselves open to those who she does love. Unlove is such a sickness. Mm -hmm. I was in a bar in Troy Hill yesterday and watched a friend of mine have racial slurs thrown at them. And my friend had to remind me, Jesse, I am okay because you're at the table loving me. Don't participate in unlove. Mm -hmm. Keep loving me. And I try to keep my focus on that and who and what I'm doing 
every single day. It's the only way you don't break yourself or someone else. Thank you. Thank you.